what are the responsibilities of a kingly priest of the order of the Melchizedek? Every priest has a responsibility. If you read the book of Leviticus and the book of Exodus, when God gave the plan for the priesthood, he gave them responsibilities. Even the attire that the high priest wears, the high priest as well as the sons, the priest, normal priest attire, even all those attire were dictated by God. They cannot just simply wear any dress they like. These are the prescribed way of dressing. Not only the prescribed way of dressing, even the color was chosen by God. This is how you should be dressed when you come before my presence. Not you just come before God's presence like you're going to a beach party. You wear super short skirts, super short pants, and then sleeveless, allless, you know. In today's modern charismatic church, the reverence for God is totally eroded. To meet a mortal man, you will be very punctual. Nobody skips an appointment. Very punctual we come. But to meet God, you take your own sweet time to come. 10 o'clock church service, people take their own sweet time to walk slowly. What's the rally? They are still worshipping, we'll go late. See, you're not coming, now listen, you're not coming to mark attendance in the church. You're not coming to show your face to your pastor, okay, yes sir. You put your fingerprint at the church in front, attendant, mark. No, you are coming to present yourselves to God. So if you are coming to present yourselves before God, you must be punctual. We should wait for God, not God wait for us. And then this other incident in India where we organize a youth camp meeting every year in January up in the Himalayan mountains. And again the same scenario. The first meeting is supposed to start at 9 o'clock. And you know, you know the musicians and the audio video technicians, they always have a different spirit. And the spirit is never start on time spirit. <laughs> so, you know, even though the cameras are all well and good, the camera will come, they will try to tune this here, tune that. And the musicians, worse are the musicians. Every time a guitarist comes, they'll try, ping, 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 ping. <laughs> and then they'll take out the mic, they'll, they'll always have to say one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Nobody ever says five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> Always the same formula all over the world. Mic testing, one, two, three. Mic testing. Why not say A, B, C, D? <laughs> you know, always the standard formula. And I always get tired of this, you know. So they, that particular day, instead of starting at 9, it started at 9.45. And I was so mad, I scolded everybody. And they gave all kinds of excuses. Genuine excuse. Or oh, this late, that late, this cable not there, that cable not here, this echo not working, that echo not working. So anyway, okay, forgiven for the first day. Second day, same thing happened. Now, what excuse they could give on the second day? Overslept, too cold in the winter. <laughs> okay, third day, something happened. Or either this happened on the first year or the second year, I cannot remember. What happened was, I was scheduled to speak in the first session. So I told my secretary, I will always be there on time. So I went, since I knew these guys are going to set up late, so I went late. So instead of 9 o'clock, I came at 9.30. And uh, all the kids were already all seated because they have no choice, compulsory. If they are not seated by 9 o'clock, then all out. So youth meeting, ma. Easy to control, you know. Huh? <laughs> anyway, when I came into the front row, where all the preachers always sit, I saw the Lord Jesus seated on the front row. 
And I was taken aback when I saw him seated there. So I asked him, Lord, what are you doing here? <laughs> As if he's not entitled to come. <laughs> actually, what I actually meant was, I, it was a slip of tongue that day, you know. What I meant actually to say was, Lord, how come you came so early? <laughs> because we didn't make the opening prayer. You see, if you observe opening prayers that people do, they say, Lord, we welcome you. So once they say that, only then the Lord is allowed to come. <laughs> so that's what actually I meant, you know. But in the slip of tongue is, how come you are here? So the Lord understood what I actually was trying to say. He told me, listen, he said, didn't you advertise that the meeting begins at 9? So I have come. No, that statement went deep into my heart like an arrow. And I knelt down there and I repented before God. Here we set a time, 9 o'clock. And the Lord came at 9 o'clock. Because my children are all going together at 9. And here I came late. That day I repented. And from that day till today, 20 years have passed by. I, I then told all our team, even if there's only one person, we begin our meeting on time. I don't care who's there. Even if there's nobody, we announce the meeting at 9, we announce the meeting at 2, we begin at that scheduled time. Because the Lord will be there, the angels of God will be there. Amen. So we punctual. You know, this is the spirit of reverence that we must learn now to have that reverential attitude the reverential fear of God, to fear God. You're not coming, listen again, you're not coming before a man. You're not coming to attend an ordinary Sunday church service. You're coming to meet with God. And God is waiting to teach you of His ways. That's the purpose of church gathering. That's the purpose. So if you, if you set your heart right, then you will get more than what you really come for. You don't even need to come to the front to get a word or get a prayer blessing. Where you are, the Lord will touch you. Just like what happened yesterday. So, reverential fear of God. A criteria for the priesthood. If we don't have the reverential fear of God, we will disqualify. So what are the responsibilities of a kingly priest of the order of the Melchizedek? Please turn your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and the verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So what is the chief responsibility of the Melchizedek priesthood? Is what you see in the last sentence, the last phrase of the scripture. To serve the living God. That is your number one calling. The number one purpose. The number one duty. The number one mandate. To serve the living God. The primary responsibility of a priest under the Old Testament is to minister unto God. That is their first calling. Not so much to serve men. That is secondary, number two. But their number one primary calling is to first minister unto God. The, the word minister unto God is mentioned 12 times in the Bible. Exodus chapter 28, verse 1, verse 3 and 4, verse 41, chapter 29, verse 1, chapter 30, verse 30, chapter 40, verse 13 and 15, Jeremiah 33, verse 22, Ezekiel 43, 19, 44, 15, and 16. Twelve times, minister unto God is mentioned. 
so the primary responsibility of the melchizedek order kingly priest is to minister unto god by waiting in his sanctuary to inquire in his holy temple concerning the judgments of god it is beyond just ministering unto god see there are two now you are not just a priest you are a kingly priest so if you are a priest you just offer sacrifices you just minister that's one part now you have an additional role kingly priest so the kingly responsibility is you come into the holy temple you sit there wait upon god to hear what he will speak to you to inquire of him of his judgments to inquire of him of his ways then you teach to other people the ways of god the righteous judgments of god you don't make your own judgment that is after sight you make your judgments inquiring from god lord what is this what is the the true things that takes place what your eyes see is not what really took place what your ears heard is not what really took place let me give you one example in the 50s the wonderful man of god called kenneth again he was ministering in a church and uh, in the church there were five wonderful praying grandmas every church has this you know they have either women or grandmas and they are the pillars they are the praying warriors who hold just like these two pillars they really hold the church up you know every church has this and these grandmas are not only prayer warriors they are also prophesizers they always come to pastor i heard a word for you ah <laughs> huh? they always used by god in for prophecy or the pastor always rely on them because they are the pillars so in that particular church there were these five grandmas so during a, a period of a, a revival meeting in the church one day the awesome glory of god came down in the church and one new believer in the church was seated right at the back stood up and gave a powerful word of prophecy and the pastor discerned it to be a true word of god and brother hagin discerned it to be a true word of god after the meeting but strangely all these grandmas were sitting in the vip seat they were unmoved so brother hagin who has been to this church many times knows this grandmas by name so he was wondering how come this grandmas were not used in prophecy and they were just sitting like lock wood not moving you know so anyway maybe they all you know some that people have off days <laughs> don't you don't laugh la you also have off day right you you have your off days so i thought okay maybe this their off day today they switch off and uh, after the meeting was over then the pastor took him to the pastor's office for a cup of tea and he inquired this pastor concerning that man he said oh he is a very new believer but zealous for the lord and then uh, okay nothing much F period finish so after that brother hagin was driving let's say for example this is the church from here he was driving his car to the hotel as he was driving he saw this man this young man walking on the road and in that town there is one particular street that is populated by prostitutes just like this area so the whole street is from the beginning to the end red light area and uh, this man turned into that street and began to walk down that street and brother hagin saw that in which shock how can this man walk down this lane of prostitutes because there's no hotel there there's no other homes that nobody lives there except left row right row all prostitutes and he was shocked how can this man is going down there and he saw that and he drove 
so he drove he came to his hotel room he was so troubled by that how can this man he gave a powerful word of prophecy and yet a few minutes later he is going to the prostitutes how can it be how can it possible so he was so troubled by that he couldn't even sleep he was tossing on the bed he on the left on the right and he was just been troubled by this question so he decided to solve the problem he got up from the bed he knelt down and he prayed he said lord i need an answer now how can you use this man who is fre- frequenting prostitutes but at the same time you came upon him and your spirit used him how is it possible because a fountain either will give out good water or bad water am i right you cannot have 50 50 right one portion of the water you taste and see is so sweet the other side you or salty water is it possible not possible right so he was so troubled by that and the lord came to him asking him what is your problem <laughs> what is your problem so he told the lord all the problem so the lord told him look you what did you actually see the lord asked him he said i saw this man walking down this lane do you know what happened after that you saw him walking down the lane but do you know what happened after that so the lord then told him what happened after that which hagin did not see the lord told him let me tell you about his life this son of mine was a womanizer that was his old life he was not only womanizing he used to frequent prostitutes almost every day of his life and that particular street is the place where he frequents every day when he gave his life to me he made a complete break but that day but every now and then he falls to the temptation because that was his lifestyle and without him realizing that day he walked down that street but when he realized where he was which you did not see he stopped where he was he knelt down and he cried to me for strength your eyes did not see all that i strengthened him to overcome he turned back and he went back to his own home your eyes did not see all this but you were quick to judge him and then the lord said by the way let me tell you about something about those grandmas <laughs> uh, you have such exalted opinion about the grandmas let me tell you something about them they have been living a life of disobedience for the last 30 years see nobody knows that and the lord said i told them to do something and till today they have not done it so that is the reason why my spirit did not come upon them and it came upon that man you see how we see and god sees so a true priest inquires in the temple of god and judges righteously that should be the attitude of the melchizedek priesthood so the primary responsibility of the melchizedek order kingly priest is to minister unto god by waiting in his sanctuary and to inquire in his holy temple for the judgments of god when did abraham got blessings from melchizedek now when did he got got it genesis chapter 14 verses 1 to 16 says after he fought wars with five kings and overcame them after the victory when he was coming back then he met with melchizedek now if you if you study about the five kings you will find something very interesting about the five kings which is a key to the blessings that abraham received from melchizedek now what is the common denominator about the five kings the five kings represents or signifies rebellion the five kings 
The five kings are Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other three related cities of the of the same attitude. In the past, for twelve long years, they were faithfully paying tribute to the other five kings. Then they decided to rebel. No, we will no more pay tribute to you. We will not do it. We will not be subservient to you. We declare independence. That's when these other five kings went to war with these five kings. So the attitude of rebellion, the attitude of stubbornness, the attitude of arrogance, the attitude of pride, the attitude of haughtiness. Five kings. You must kill these five kings. When you kill these five kings, then you have overcome. You have overcome to receive this Melchizedek anointing and the blessing. So, what does this? What does this tell us? Number one: reign over yourself. Reign over yourself. The self is the greatest enemy you can ever find anywhere. Even worse than Satan. Yourself. You know why it's worse than Satan? Because Satan is Satan. Okay, already gone for good. But you redeem, but self still alive. You are redeemed, sanctified. But yourself, the I is still there, so that makes you worse than Satan. Am I right? The self. You must reign over the self, overcome the self. Your body is the temple of God, and you are the priest. But as king, you must reign over that self. Your spirit man must exercise that kingly authority to subjugate yourself. Unless and until yourself dies, you will not become an overcomer. Unless and until yourself dies, yourself is crucified. In any given situation, the self will trip you down. The self will cause you to fall. You look at the life of Samson. He was mightily anointed by the Holy Spirit. Of the seven spirits of God, he had the Spirit of the Lord upon him. But he had a weakness in his life, the lust of the flesh. That was his weakness. And though he was mightily anointed, he did great exploits. Every now and then, he will trip and fall, right? Now, what caused the tripping is that weakness of his flesh. He tripped and he fell. He tripped and he fell. He tripped and he fell. Finally, he came to a time. You know, let me tell you one thing, okay? Now, let's suppose, ah, uh, the the wonderful gift of grace stretches from this end to that end. So, you start your journey here. You trip, you fall. God's grace reach. Trip and you fall. You trip and you fall. Sooner or later, you will come to this end. When you come here, you trip, you fall, you are out. You are out. You are no more within that protective covering anymore. This is what happened to Samson. From the beginning till he met Delilah, you know how many women, lustful women, he met with, he slept with, but each time the grace of God was there. And God used his mother and father to correct him, but he wouldn't listen to anybody until he came to this place. Even then, even when he was flirting with Delilah, the, he was still within that grace. When he stepped over, you know, when he despised his anointing, that was when he stepped over. When he counted the costly grace of God as nothing, like Esau, for one bowl of 
prawn noodles <laughs> or fish ball noodles for, for one bowl. He said, okay, I don't value my birthright, which was to say, I don't care about my anointing. I want this flesh. That's what Samson told Delilah, I don't care about my anointing. I want you. So he was willing to trade the anointing. He didn't realize he was already at the age. He thought he was still long time. He was already at the age. The moment he spoke, okay, this is it. He fell. The spirit of the Lord left him. Same thing happened to King Saul. The same thing happened to Judas. And the same thing, okay, now we'll come to the, okay, you may say, you may argue with me, but all these are the Old Testament. But now under the new covenant, we have the blood that extends forever. I agree with you 100%. But if you read the book of Acts, the apostle Paul says, Demas, who was my associate, left me for the love of the world and went back to the world. Right? Demas is one of Paul's right hand assistant. But the love of the world came inside him and he left. He left the grace of God. So it's possible to fall away. Don't be deceived by some deceptive doctrines of demons that say, once safe, forever safe. Or demonic doctrines that say, you know, the Jesus also died for you on the cross. No matter what you do, no matter how you live, you're always safe. That's the latest doctrine of demon that teaches that. The grace covers you abundantly. We all live by grace, right? But that does not mean we despise the grace of God. So we need to walk in reverential fear. You must overcome the self. You must overcome. Why you must overcome? Luke chapter 17 verse 21 says, The kingdom of God is within you. It is within you. Because the kingdom of God is within you, Romans chapter 6 verse 13 says, You must now allow the kingdom of God to have dominion over each organ of your body. Every organ in your body. Like the 31 kings in Canaan land. You must overcome them, fight them and bring them all under subjection so that Jerusalem or rather Mount Zion can become the capital in your life. And when Mount Zion becomes the capital, King Jesus will rule and reign in the Mount Zion of your life. Romans chapter 6 verse 12 and 14 says, Sin must no longer reign in our body. It must not. But it's still like there. You feel that. The reason is because you don't kill the kings. You just pamper the king. You know, we just pamper the king, say, don't worry, king. I know you are there. But what to do? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we take, you see, we misquote another scripture to, as excuse for our weaknesses. Each time we trip, Pastor, my spirit is willing. But what to do? My flesh is so weak. No, you cannot always, baby Christians can say that. But not a matured believer. When you meditate, okay, how to overcome this self? There's only one way. No other way. This is the only way. When you meditate the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and apply that death to the area of your life, you will become dead in Christ to the world. Romans chapter 8 verse 13 tells us that. The only, that's the only way. Death of the Lord Jesus on the cross. Once you meditate that, you meditate and you meditate, you meditate until that becomes inside you. Then, you are dead with Christ in Christ. 
then all the scriptures that say we are dead with Christ will become very meaningful, very practically real in your life. So meditate on the death of the Lord Jesus. What the Lord Jesus died physically is you dying to your flesh. And your victory or your power that you can draw from Christ Jesus for you to die is by meditating on his death. When you meditate on the death, then you're drawing that anointing to crucify your flesh, to crucify yourself so that you can die. That's the only way. No other way. Don't waste your time fasting and praying. I show you a shortcut. Shortcut is meditate. But worldly shortcuts means you go this way, you can reach a point quickly. But this will not take place overnight. Because there are already 31 layers inside you. Like onion, you know, you keep peel on, peel, 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 peel until nothing exists. You must become like that. L, you must become olam, vanish. You don't exist anymore. That should be your goal. The I in you. Today, you have heard it is possible. Today, I have given you the sword of the Spirit. And I have given you secrets of the five wounds of Jesus. You meditate that, that is your success. You know, if you look at the cross in one way, it looks like a sword with a handle on the top and a long, long pole, right? That is your sword. Take that sword and strike at all the 31 kings in your life. Amen? Amen. When the process of death is completed, then the spirit will quicken life in you to reign as kings because you have overcome. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. The Spirit of Christ will quicken you only when you die. If you don't die, He will not quicken you. The Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead only after He died. Right? Yes. Not before that. So even the Son of Man has to completely die before the Spirit of life can come upon Him and raise Him up back to life. That's the same process that will take place inside you. When you truly die, then the spirit will quicken you and you will rise up. That spirit man in you will rise up, resurrected. And you will begin to be the kingly priest. You will walk in that dominion and the authority like how Adam had walked. Meant to walk. It will be yours. You are a priest to minister unto God in worship and love for God. Now this is responsibility number two. What is your number two responsibility? You are a priest to minister unto God in worship and love for God. Not just worship. As a priest, you are to call upon the name of God. This is the most important responsibility. You must receive a revelation of the name of God. The Lord Jesus said in his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, I have revealed your name to them. What name did he reveal to them? The name that the Lord revealed to them, you can get the same revelation. The name of God revealed to you, a personal name. You know, if you read the Revelation chapter 2 and 3, to one of the churches, the Lord said, I will give you a new stone. New stone has three things written there. One, your new name. Your new name written there. Number two, the name of your God. And number three, name of the city of God. The three things are there. Okay, don't worry too much about your name. 
Because if not now, tomorrow you will find that out. But the most important is to find out the name of God. What is the name of God? And you call upon that name of God. It is very powerful to call upon the name of God. So far in the Bible, there are five characters or five men of God who call upon the name of God. Genesis chapter 4 verse 26, Seth was the first person to call upon the name of God. Genesis chapter 12 verse 8, Abraham called upon the name of God. Genesis 26 verse 25, Isaac called upon the name of God. Genesis 28 verse 18 and 19, chapter 31 verse 13, Jacob called upon the name of God. Psalms 99 verse 6, Samuel called upon the name of God. Five characters from the Old Testament. Now I show you something new. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they all may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. Now who are this day? This day are you. So you are the sixth person in this category to whom God will reveal the name. And you are to call upon God in that name. You see that three things mentioned in the scripture. Number one, God will restore a pure language. So a pure, the pure language of heaven, you will learn it. Number two, you'll, with the pure language that you call upon God, then you will know the name of God. Now let me ask you one question. When God met Adam and Eve, the Bible says every day God came and met with them. Right? He not only met with them, He also talked with them. With what language did God talk with them? Years ago, you know, when uh, I'll give you a clue, okay? Since you all are staring at my face. <laughs> Years ago, I think in 1984, I met a very saintly senior man of God, a sadhu, another sadhu. And he has a great reputation to be really a saint. So I met him and we were sitting down talking. And after all the small talks, he looked at me and he asked me, little brother, does God talk with you? I very humbly, you know, he's a great man. How to say, yes, of course, sir. So I meekfully I say, yes. So then he asked me a second question. In what language does God talk with you? So I looked at him, I said, no, sometimes in English, sometimes in the Tamil language. As soon as I said that, he burst into a laughter. Oh, until the whole room was reverberating with this great roar of laughter. I thought to myself, what mistake did I make? It's true, no? English, sometimes Tamil, either one. <laughs> Nothing wrong. I, I didn't answer the question wrongly. After his laughter died down, he looked at me and he said, Oh, please don't feel insulted that I looked down on you. He said, God does not talk in English or Tamil or any other languages. He talks in his own language. The Holy Spirit interprets the language of God in a language that you understand. See, he, the scripture says pure language. But what language is pure language? Huh? God language. So, which means language of heaven. Right? So, the language of heaven will now be given to the last day's generation. Amen. Amen. That is the language the Melchizedek priesthood is going to use to call upon God for temple services, for temple worship. You will be taught that language. It's a different language. I have heard that in heaven, you know. I've even seen the writings in heaven. But it's so different. It looks like something quite similar to ancient Hebrew. Ancient Hebrew is like line, line. Have you seen ancient Hebrew? No. So that's another good reason 
all of you should come to our conference in Israel this June. Then I will take you to the museum and show you this ancient Hebrew writing dating back to 5,000 years. See, when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, he wrote with his finger, right? So that it was in a language that he wrote. Ancient Hebrew, but not exactly like that. So there is a writing in heaven, the pure language that will be taught to the children of, not the children, the kingly, priestly, Melchizedek order priests. That's why God sent the apostle, the Saint Paul today with that scroll in his hand. That scroll has that revelation. That revelation of the Melchizedek, the fuller revelation. What I receive, I will not say is complete. Just a little bit. And there's more. When you keep on meditating what I have shared with you, God will give you more revelation. You can receive greater than what I receive. Because what I share, you, you use it as a foundation and you can step on it and go one step higher. Then you will get more and more. See, the revelations of God are not limited to just one person. There are multiple levels of revelations that God can give you understanding. Amen? Amen. So the last days prophetic generation are the ones that are mentioned in Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 9. And when you call upon the name of God, what is it that you are actually calling upon? You are not just calling upon the name of God, you are proclaiming the king's rule to establish the king's reign in a place. You are proclaiming the king's rule to be established. The king, to establish the king's reign in a particular place. What do I mean by that? If you read Genesis chapter 28, verse 18 and 19. Now let's look at the scripture. 18. Then Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put on his head, set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of the city had been loose previously. And then in chapter 31 verse 13. Now in, in 18 and 19, Jacob had an encounter with God. In that un encounter, he receives a revelation of God. In fact, he received a revelation of the name of God. And when he set up the stone pillar, he called that place. Bethel. He proclaimed the name of God. As a result, the reign of God came upon that place. Now you look at 31, 13. Again, in that very same place, Jacob has an encounter with God. Now God speaks to him. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. So look at the first part. The place where you anointed the pillar, the place where you proclaim my name, I am that God. I am the God of Bethel. So when you proclaim the name of God, you are proclaiming the reign, the rule, the kingdom rule of God to come and possess that place. So can you imagine if a large number of Christians in this country gather together in one place, you all lift up the hands of God and you proclaim the name of God in your city. What are you doing? You are bringing the kingdom of God rule to that city. Amen. Not just simply gathering together for worship, praise, no, see, all these are babyhood Christianity. You know, you don't always do that. That is part of it. You must progress from there. Enter into the holy place. Don't just always stay in the outer court. You do this activity, that activity. See, in the outer court, there is what? Furniture number one. 
Donna ma? Brazen altar. Furniture number two? Why she basin right? Okay. You know, ninety nine percent of all our Christian activity is only there. You are always repenting of your sins. You are always repenting. All is following, falling down. Or number three, always asking for things. And then, if you progress a little bit, you come to the labor washing. What it is? You play in the water. <laughs> okay, playing in the water. Children like to play in the water, right? Now, what is it? Worship. That's what. The level of water represents worship, praise, and worship. So most of all of activity is only here. You don't progress from here into the holy place. See, then there is another small group who progress. They come to the holy place. When you enter the holy place, on the left hand side there is this lamp stand, and the lamp stand is popularly thought saying. It's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you're standing here, all speaking in tongues, you're jumping up and down, saying that I'm Holy Ghost filled. Goose bump, mosquito bump, all the bumps come. <laughs> Always jumping up and down. But I tell you one thing, okay? I don't mean to insult anybody. The baptism of the Holy Spirit revelation from the lamp stand is the most basic. Understanding of the lamp stand. That's the most basic. Not even Ginta Garden, preschool below below that. <laughs> what? <Yeah>. Childcare. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Below. Ah, uh, inf. Ah, uh, thank you, thank you for that word. Infant care. That's right. Thank you. Infant care. That's that's but. There's more. You see why there are eleven, seven branches there. Why? See you. You only stand there. Infant care. Thank you. I will not forget that. <laughs> In my next book, I will mention that infant care. You only there base at the base. Infant care. Why is the lampstand made of one solid gold? Then the center shaft. From the center shaft, three branches on the right, three branches on the left. Why? See, each one has a powerful walk with the Holy Spirit. Deeper truth, and then that's where you stay. But you know what is the heart desire of God? You even bypass this holy place, come into the most holy place, where there is the throne of God. The Ark of the Covenant. There, you cease from all your activities. You don't make. You are no more repenting, crying, no more playing in the water, no more jumping with goosebumps. Finish all that, and no, no more just always eating bread. <laughs> Bypass all that. You come and stand before God, and you you say to God, Lord, look into my heart. You know, I tell you one secret. This is how God revealed to me. When you reach that stage, your heart will be like the naked body of Adam, Adam before God. Adam was naked, right? Right. That's what the Bible says. No, your heart and your mind. That is your goal to make your mind and heart naked before God. Nothing hidden between you and God. It means when he looks at you, he can see all your whole heart, your whole mind. No secrets between you and God. When you reach that level, what is in the ark? The Shekinah glory of God, right? Moses saw the glory of God, and God spoke with him from between the cherubim. That would be your privilege. You see the glory of God. You hear God's voice talking to you. No more second-hand news. You know what is second-hand news? What? No more second-hand news is coming to somebody else. God talks to you directly. Amen. See, that is the desire of God. So He's waiting for you there. But what do you do? Always playing games here, <laughs> yeah, playing with the water. No. 
infant care. care. No more infant care. Let's, let's grow. Amen? Amen? So the patriarchs, they all built altars at strategic places and call upon God's name. What they were actually doing is proclaiming the reign of God in the promised land before the children of Israel came there. That's what Abraham did. That's what Isaac did. That's what Jacob did. They all were proclaiming, walking all over the land. You know, that was the original call of Abraham. He was the first one to do prayer walk. And if you study his life carefully, he walked the outer perimeter of the entire land that God had promised for Israel. He walked and claimed that territory so that at the future appointed time, Israel will come and inherit that land. That's what they did. Every strategic location, he builds an altar, calls upon the name of the Lord. And the kingdom rule of God comes and abides there. The next responsibility. Bringing people to meet with God. The responsibility of a priest to bring people to meet with God. You don't bring people to your church. Don't bring people to your prayer meeting. Don't bring people to your conference. Don't bring your people to your books. No. You bring people to meet with God. Exodus chapter 19 verses 14 to 17. In verse 14 says, So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes and he said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Verse 17 says, And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. That is your call. That is the call of duty, responsibility of the Melchizedek priest to bring people to meet with God. A Melchizedek priest should draw people to God and not to yourselves. If you read Genesis chapter 14 verse 18, it says Melchizedek drew Abraham towards God. How did he do that? When he brought out that bread and the wine. When he brought out the bread, he was drawing him towards God. Now look at the word brought out. The word brought out in the Hebrew is yatsa. Y-A-T-S-A. And yatsa means to go out or also to direct. So he was directing Abraham towards God. Look to God. That was what Melchizedek brought. And you know, that's the same word used for Moses. He brought the people out to meet with God. The same Hebrew word is used there. Yatsa. Means they were directing the people towards God. Now Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. What is that? Psalms 104 verse 15. And wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. So three things are mentioned here. Wine, bread, and oil. So what is important for us now is not oil, but bread and wine. Let's just look at the two. Now look at the first word, glad. Makes the heart glad. What does glad mean? Psalms 34 verse 8 says, Taste and see how good God is. When you taste and see, it will gladden your heart. So what does that mean? Desires awaken to know God. Those desires are awakened. So that is making the heart glad. Number two, it says strengthen man's heart. What does strengthen means? It means you are stirred. 
to seek to know God more. Now, after this incident, after eating bread and wine from Melchizedek, if you study the life of Abraham from chapter 15 onwards, there is a drastic change in his life. A drastic change in the way that God dealt with him and he approached God. What change? His life changed and God begins to make covenants with Abraham. Before that, God gave him promise. But after this incident, the encounter with Melchizedek, God made a covenant with him. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 9 to 21, God made a covenant. And the third person who brought people to meet with God is Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19. Now these, those are the responsibilities. Now, we need to ask a question. What will happen when you begin to do that? What will happen to you when you will begin to fulfill your responsibility? Number one, the kingdom of heaven's rule will be birthed inside you. That's the first thing that will happen. You are the first beneficiary. The kingdom of God will be birthed inside you. Not just the kingdom, but the kingdom's rule. It will be birthed inside you. Now, what does the kingdom of God represent? Or what is inherent? Inherent in the kingdom of God. Many things. Number one. The kingdom of God is light. When it begins to rule in you, the light in you will begin to increase in intensity. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27 says, The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. So your spirit is, is a candle. The day that you got saved, it was lighted. So you became alive. You are no more darker inside you. But the degree of that brightness should increase. Should increase from the day you are born till the day you are caught home. It must increase. Of course, it can also remain at the same level till the day you die. Which means you don't grow at all. But the light must increase. A good scriptural reference for that is in Matthew 17 where the Lord Jesus was transfigured. You know, if you read that portion very carefully, his transfiguration came from within him, not from outside. No light shone on him. But the light within him grew in intensity. It grew and it grew and it grew until it all broke through his sweat pores and it came out and began to shine out. What the Lord experienced, each and every one of you can have the same transfiguration experience. Believe? Yes. It is absolutely possible when you allow the light to increase inside you. Secondly, the kingdom of God is peace, joy, and love. It will begin to flood your inner being and flow out from you. The peace of God, John chapter 14 verse 27 Chapter 16, verse 33, is beyond understanding, not ordinary peace, beyond understanding. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. Secondly, the joy. Joy of Jesus will be inside you. It will begin to flow out. John chapter 15, verse 11. John chapter 17, verse 13. And thirdly, the love of the Father will be in you. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15. Chapter 4 verse 7 to 10. When that love, peace and joy fills your heart and flows out, that love will even call a betrayer friend. Matthew chapter 26 verse 50. The Lord Jesus called Judas friend. Even though he came to betray him, no? And then in Luke 23, verse 34, love will plead for your persecutors. 
It, do, it doesn't curse the persecutor. It prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. You, you tell me one thing, don't they know what they are doing? Technically, they knew. In the natural, they knew. But from the spiritual point of view, they didn't know what they were actually doing. They were actually fulfilling all prophecy. So that is why the Lord prayed for them. Don't let this charge be on them. Because they are just little children. They didn't know what they were doing. Thirdly, the kingdom of God is righteousness. Romans chapter 14 verse 17. When it begins to rule in you, you will become a doer of righteousness and judge others in righteousness. You will not judge after the flesh, nor what your eye sees, but after righteousness. Number four, the kingdom of God is holy. Holiness will flow out from you, which will convict others of sin. In Luke chapter 5 verse 8, the Lord Jesus Christ went fishing with Peter and John. After catching a boatload of fishes, Peter looked at the Lord Jesus and he said, Lord, go away from me. You are convicting me of sin. The very presence of the Lord convicted Peter of his sin. Have you all heard of Smith Wigglesworth? This great man of God was once traveling on a train. And you know, Smith Wigglesworth has a a wonderful habit of always carrying a New Testament in his coat. And all the time, he will be reading the New Testament. The difference between him and us is, we are all the time serving on the web. <laughs> of, we are serving the Facebook, we are serving Twitter, all the time with our smartphone, trying to make us smart. <laughs> but Smith Wigglesworth, always reading the New Testament, he doesn't talk much. Talk very, never talks unnecessarily. After every few sentences, you will say, let us all now pray. So one day he was traveling the train. He just minded his own business. He opened the New Testament, started reading. And in the compartment, there were six other people. And he never spoke with anybody. After a few minutes, three guys fell on their knees and they started crying. And they started crying. And then Smith also looked up to them. And he said, Sir, you are convicting me of sin. So Smith Wiggles said, What did I do? I was just reading my book. No, sir, your face is shining like a light. And it is convicting me of sin. See? When you are full of the holiness of God, your presence, the holiness within you, will convict others of sin. Number five. The kingdom of God is power. You will demonstrate the kingdom power in this world to set the captives free. In Matthew chapter 12 verse 28, you will read that the Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated the power of God by casting out demons. What are the benefits of being a kingly priest in the order of the Melchizedek? What are the benefits? Okay, we look at the many things already. We saw the responsibilities. Now, we look at the benefits. Okay, by, by being a Melchizedek priest, what are the benefits I'm going to get? Or the privileges? The Lord Jesus Christ went within the veil as a high priest and sat on the throne as a king. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now look at the scripture very carefully again. Normally, no high priest sits on the throne. They stand to minister. But who sits on the throne? A king sits on the throne. So here you see the Lord Jesus Christ, when he entered into heaven, he was a king and a priest. And the other thing is, he sat at the right hand of God. What is the right hand? 
the right hand is the place of power authority and dominion first peter chapter 3 verse 22 so he sat at the power, right hand of god so as a king he now has power authority and dominion how did he receive all this through the offering of himself what he did on the cross and where he is he did something what did he do by offering his own body he tore his body and opened a way for you to be crowned as a kingly priest as he is that's what he has done hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 to 22 tells us like that through the tearing of his body a way has been made for us all to enter in the tearing of his body the temple veil the bible tells us was torn in two when he died on the cross have you read that okay the tearing of the temple veil caused a way to be open now for any common person to enter into the most holy place from the time of moses or even from the time that adam was cast out of eden from that time till that time the lord jesus died on the cross no commoner was allowed to enter into the most holy place but when the lord jesus died when he say it is finish the temple veil was torn which means the cherubim and the flaming sword that was protecting the tree of life they departed they departed their duty finish no more because the blood has been shed the temple will all torn not necessary anymore now there is free access everyone can come because a way has been made through the body of the lord jesus christ now the lord jesus is seated on god's right hand as king and priest likewise we are seated now you imagine like this let's suppose this is the throne of god and the lord jesus is seated on the right hand of god and he has his throne they don't share right hand but you don't have a separate throne you sit on the very throne where the lord jesus is seated which means you are co heir co heir with the lord jesus christ that is the privilege he has given you that is why you are called into the order of the melchisedek now let me show you one thing in the aaronic priesthood there is two group one aaron and his priests any sons that is that is called the aaronic priesthood the other group is the children of the levites the sons of levi the sons of levi cannot do the work that only aaron and his sons can do they will do all the outer work they tear down not they tear down they bring down the tabernacle furniture they carry they set up that's their work they cannot come into the holy place to offer sacrifices that's only for the aaronic priesthood so though they are all from the same tribe yet there is a veil that is separated but we are not like that the order of melchisedek is not like that there's no two group in the order of melchisedek in the order of melchisedek everyone is a king and a priest everyone the call is extended to everybody and the lord jesus christ is the great high priest of the melchisedek order so we all are co priests working together with the great high priest that is the privilege that is the call ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 revelation chapter 3 verse 21 and chapter 20 verse 6 all seated together with christ on thrones everybody you are given each one of you is given a throne you know a throne is kingly 
not given to every ordinary believer who is in heaven. There are some who will be just ordinary citizens in heaven. But there will be some who will be kingly. They will all be seated on the throne. In, during Rosh Hashanah of 2015, the Lord called me to fast and pray in Jerusalem for seven days. And one particular day, an angel of God visited me early in the morning, said, today you have an appointment with God. So at exactly at 9 a.m., get ready and present yourselves before God. So I didn't know what was going to transpire, but this kind of messages I always frequently I get. Get ready at this particular time, God will come to meet with you. So 9 a.m., uh, before that, I knelt down and I began to worship the Lord. And just exactly at 9 a.m., on the dot, see, that's why I emphasize to you about this punctuality. On the dot, this angel came again, the same angel. Are you ready? I said, yes. Come, let's go. The next second, I was translated in heaven. And in heaven, I, I was standing in a place that looks looked like a courtyard, like a, you know, like a place where there's an amputator, that vast area, but there is no, this amputator sitting was not there. Instead, in that vast area, from one end up to another end, in a semicircle or an arc, there were many thrones. And behind them, on a very large elevated throne, the Lord Jesus was seated, very grand, very gigantic. And all these on other thrones, there were the many patriarchs, prophets that you read in the Bible. And I also recognize two men of God whom I know on the earth. They have died and gone home to the Lord. One of them died in the year 2006. The other one of them died in the year 2008. But I saw both of them in heaven. And they were all seated in these thrones that were like, and I knew in my spirit, these were right, really elders in heaven. So I came and stood there. I didn't know what was happening. So I stood in the center looking at all these uh, saints. Everyone looked very serene and very frightening except these two men that I know. They, when they looked at me, they just smiled, gently smiled. So that made me feel at ease. See, okay, two person I know. And the Lord, as soon as I came, he looked up at me, he said, and he proclaimed to all the people who were gathered there, I have purpose that my son, Sundar Salvaraj, and then he said something else, which no need to tell you all. <laughs> <laughs> no need. So he went on saying, and then this is what I propose. Now what do you all say? You know, Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, God will not do anything before he reveals to his prophets, right? So, you know, only then I realized I have been brought for an interview <laughs> for a selection process or for a confirmation. And the Lord turned to each one of them and every one of them gave a report about me. Each one of them, I was shocked. And they were, you know, if I tell you the names of the saints who are seated there, they are like the who's and who of the Bible. Every one of them gave good report. Good thing, you know. And then came to these men that I knew. Because I knew them personally on earth. So the Lord turned to one particular man and said, What do you say? And he stood up and he said, Lord, I know this young man very well. You can safely trust him and give him this job. So after the Lord heard from every one of them, and then he said, All right, from this day onwards, I am crowning you to do this particular work for this purpose. So the point that I'm telling you is this, that I saw all of them seated on thrones. So that is a kingly, priestly anointing. The Melchizedek order anointing. You are seated on a throne. 
that is your privileged position. So if you are seated on a throne, it means that you are not in the outer court playing in the water. No more. You are now in serious business. The kingly priestly ministry is not in the outer court where you only deal with the first principles of doctrine. If you read Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, and the Apostle Paul says, I can't teach you deep things because you are still very childish. And then he says, now grow, grow out of the first principles. Now what are the first principles? Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Now look at that, elementary school. Infant education, huh? Infant care, ah, infant care. Even the care needs education, right? <laughs> ah, this is elementary principles of Christ. He said, you know, first he says two things. Elementary principles of Christ, and then he said, go on to perfection. So what are the elementary principles of Christ? He explains there. Repentance from dead works. Faith toward God. Doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. These are all basic, basic teachings that you should teach to new believers. But you don't keep on teaching them all the time, even to those who are donkey years in Christ. See, don't keep on doing that again and again and again, which means you're not progressing. Here the Apostle Paul says, come on, Come out of that. Go towards perfection. Now what is that going towards perfection? To go on to perfection means to enter by faith. To enter the throne of God by faith because of the blood of Jesus. And enter boldly into the throne of God because the Lord Jesus is seated on the mercy seat. You don't, you're not coming, you know the Apostle Paul described very beautifully in Hebrews 12, you're not coming before Mount Sinai that quakes with fire, that makes you so trembling. No, you're coming before Mount Zion. Mount Zion is very gentle, very nice. Why? Because the Lamb is on the top of Mount Zion. Not fire and quaking on Mount Sinai. No, there's big difference. You have come before Mount Zion. See, because you're coming before Mount Zion, the Lord Jesus is seated there, need not fear. Now I share with you a mystery about the Ark of the Covenant. I am going to share with you how exactly the Lord explained to me. The mercy seat is composed of two furniture. One is the chess box, and the other is a mercy seat. You know, I wrote a book called The Prayer Seekers in the Tabernacle. And if you read that book, and now I need to update that book with this new revelation, because I've, I never saw it like that until the Lord revealed to me two days ago. I never saw the Ark of the Covenant as two. I saw them only as one. But they are actually two pieces in one. So it's two in one. It's a chess box and a mercy seat. Now what does the chess box represent? The chess box represents the throne of God. And it contains three things. The Ten Commandments on a tablet, the manna, and the rod of Aaron that budded. So what does these three things signify to us today? The Ten Commandments signifies the law of the king. Among all the laws that God spoke, the basic tenet of the law of God's kingdom is the Ten Commandments. That's the basic. You throw away the rest, this ten remains forever. This ten were not nailed to the cross. Agreed, everybody? All the ceremonial laws were nailed on the cross. But the Ten Commandments were not nailed. Because if they are nailed, 
then you can worship any other god. Right? No, they were not nailed. They are that perpetual. So that is the law of the king. Number two, manna. What is the manna? The spoken oracles of the king. That which comes out of the king. Number three, the rod is the authority of the king. Now look at the mercy seat. It is a, a, just a lid put on top of the chest box. When the high priest sprinkles the blood, he sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat. So the mercy seat is actually not a very pleasant thing to look at because it's covered with blood all over. It's, it's a bloody thing. Blood sprinkles, splash here and there, everywhere. Now what does that speak? Why the blood was sprinkled there? Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24. The blood of the Lord Jesus intercedes on your behalf. On the mercy seat, appealing on your behalf for God's mercies. Day and night, he ever lives to make intercession for you. He's standing there, pleading, pleading, pleading before God's judgment, before God's justice. His mercy speaks. Because of the Lord's pleading, we have not been destroyed. Amen? We have not received any of the due judgments upon us because of the priestly intercessions of the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood is always there speaking on your behalf. So the Ark of the Covenant, including the mercy seat, represents the throne of God on which Jesus Christ sits as the king and priest. When you come boldly like a king before God's throne, before the ark to intercede, you will be shown. Now, this is one of the benefits as, as a kingly priest. When you come before the ark, you stand there and you begin to intercede for anything. You will be shown from heaven's perspective concerning the situation that you're praying for. God shows you his point of view, that which you are not able to see. Let me give you one scriptural example, and then I will give you one recent experience I had. 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 1 to 28. Syria planned a war against Israel. You see, what happened then is also happening now. Right? History has not changed. So is Syria planned a war against Israel, and the king of Judah came to help the king of Israel. So the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, is a very godly man. King of Israel is Ahab, very wicked man. So while they were making plans to have a combined strategy to attack Syria, Jehoshaphat posed a question. He said, okay, before we go for war, let us seek the will of God. What is God's will? Shall we go for war or not for war? So as soon as he said that, Ahab said, all right, I will call the prophets to inquire from the Lord. And he called the 400 prophets of Ashtaroth that Elijah failed to kill. Those guys came and stood before Ahab. And they all began to prophesy, Yes, king, we see that you will be victorious. Come on, go! The, the Syrian army will fall under your feet. So that was the prophecy they gave. As soon as Jehoshaphat heard that, his spirit was ajar. He said, no, this is not right. He didn't bear witness. So he said, it's amazing, no? He said, is there a prophet of God whom we can ask for prayer? As soon as Jehoshaphat said that, King Ahab, he had the database of all the prophets in the land. You know, 
he had the database. So immediately he saw, and not only he had the database, he also knew who are the true prophets of God. So immediately he said, oh yeah, there is one guy, Micaiah. I don't like him because he doesn't prophesy good things to me. <laughs> See, if you want people to only prophesy good things to you, you don't need a prophet. You can just speak to yourself. <laughs> You stand at the mirror and you say, thus says the Lord. <laughs> you, you don't need anybody to prophesy. You just prophesy to yourself. <laughs> if, you, if God gives you a word, whether you like it or don't like it, it's a word from God. So anyway, King Jehoshaphat said, OK, please call that guy. So Micaiah came. Verses 19 to 23 says, Micaiah, when he was praying, he saw heaven. Heaven so open, and he saw the judgment throne of God, and God showed him what will happen when they go for war. Which was contrary to the prophecies that the 400 guys gave. See, when you truly seek God, when you enter into the holy place, you stand before the Ark of the Covenant, you will be shown from heaven's perspective. Now on 31st March, 2018, my nephew's future father-in-law, something happened in their ministry. One night on that day, one of their staff, a 26-year-old young man, he suddenly died of a heart attack. And he was the only son in the family. And he was the only breadwinner. And they come from a very poor village. So his meagre income supports the whole family. And now this boy suddenly died in the middle of the night. And uh, so it was a very pathetic thing. And uh, my nephew's future wife, she called me. She was crying on the phone. She said, Papa, please help. We don't know what's happening. It's going to become a big police case. Right? It happens, isn't it? Big police case, we don't know what happened. And this guy is such a gem. She, she painted a, such a glowing good thing about this boy. So I told her, don't worry, my daughter. I will pray. No need to worry, nothing to fear. So the first question I asked was, did this boy really die medically? Can he be medic? Yeah, he died medically. OK. In the morning, first thing in the morning, I mean, not first thing in the morning, right now, call the police, ask them to come, do a post-mortem get a medical certificate that he literally died of heart attack so that you are legally, you all are cleared. So after saying that, I encouraged her, I said, go to bed, don't worry about all this. And then I went to bed, but I couldn't sleep. So I decided to spend the time praying. So you know what happened was, that ministry's founder was a mighty man of God. He was like a spiritual father to me in the 80s. And in his ministry, he had raised up 16 people from the dead. So that's how his ministry was. So when I was lying on the bed, these thoughts came flooding into my mind. You know, how can this boy die in that ministry? And he has given his life to the ministry. So since the man of God has raised dead, why can't I raise him up? So this, when these thoughts ran in my mind, I decided to do that. So I knelt down. And I began to intercede and pray. As I was praying for the boy, I saw the heavens open before me. And the Lord said, come up. So when I went up to heaven, the Lord asked me, what do you want? So I told all this, the incident to the Lord. I said, this is what happened, Lord. And as soon as the Lord heard this, he said, come, let's go to the Father's presence and talk about this problem. So I told him, this is a small matter. Why go all the way to the father's prison? <laughs> the reason, because I'm always scared to go there, you know. I fear and tremble and shake. Although I have been given a privilege to go into that presence, and it's been many times now, each time I go, I, I'm so frightened to stand there, to hear the thunder voice. It's really scary. So the Lord said, don't worry, son. Come, let's go. 
So in the next moment, we were translated to that place. And came the thunder voice, what do you want? <laughs> so I presented all this before the father. I said, father, this boy, this is what happened. And you know, this ministry raised by this mighty God, you did great works for him. And now look at this boy, Lord, he's such a gem of a person. So I, I told the Lord everything that I was told. Then something wonderful happened, you know. The father who was seated, who appeared like a bean of cloud on the mountain, he transformed like the Lord Jesus and came and stood before me. So the Lord Jesus is standing by my side, but now I saw a cloud being, like the height of the Lord Jesus, come and stand beside us. Maybe he knew I was getting frightened, no? <laughs> so he came very gentle. See, this is how good God is, no? He is very gentle, very kind, very meekful with us. He came and stood before me and he said, let me tell you something that you do not know about this boy. And the Lord showed me, the Father showed me the secrets of this boy. And the first thing he said was, that boy was sent by the devil to destroy this ministry. He is the devil's agent. And he was in the ministry doing witchcraft against this ministry. And that is the reason why I strike him dead. I gave him space to repent. But he would not repent. So when I heard this, I was shocked and surprised. Okay, that settled it. No need to pray for resurrection anymore. <laughs> right? no, no need. So the next morning, I called this family and I told them, okay, this is what I heard from God. Therefore, don't feel guilty anymore. Because till that moment, they were all feeling guilty that a righteous boy had died. It's not righteous. It's a devil's agent. You know, even today, there are people planted in the churches, sent by the devil, and they are agents sitting in your church to put witchcraft. One witchcraft is to break up the pastor's family. So that's why you see today, so many pastors are divorcing one another, right? Or they are falling into adultery sin. These are all the works of witchcraft, putting witchcraft curses on the pastors to break the pastor's family. Once the pastor's family is broken or they fall to adultery sin, they lose the moral right to pastor the church. You strike the shepherd, you scatter the sheep. See, that's the devil's plan. So why cry over a devil's agent? Even in our ministry you now, when the devil sends such agents, the Lord points to me, said, this is the devil's agent. Sometimes I'm not allowed to cast them out immediately. Okay, let them allow them for a season now. I will show you when exactly to kick them out. Sometimes the fruit need to manifest, you know. The fruit manifests for all to see. So this happens in this case. That is why it is very, very important to have a good intercessory prayer team in a church. You must counter all these agents of the devil. Strong intercessory prayer team that must know how to take hold of the throne of God. Then you go into the throne of God to fight the battle there. Then you will defeat all these enemies. Normal prayer will not get rid of them. You must enter into the throne room to take hold of the horns of God and then battle through to defeat the enemy. That's why I'm telling you again and again, don't play in the water. Come out. Get past the water stage. Go into the holy place. That's the lampstand. The Holy Spirit will give you revelation, give you understanding, teach you warfare strategies, how to come against all these workers of the enemy. There are false prophets who have gone out. False teachers gone out. False pastors gone out. False apostles gone out. And then wolves in sheep's clothing all gone out, all mingling everywhere in the body of Christ. 
So how they are the one who's tearing apart your church. All the unnecessary problems that come in the church, how do they come? Is these people there, planted in your church. But I tell you one secret, how to get rid of these people. If the church is a strong praying church, the fire of God will be kindled in the church. And the fire of God will drive these people out. After some time, they cannot stand the fire anymore. They will be driven out of the church. So the church must be a praying church. Cannot be a sleeping church. Cannot be an entertainment center. If the church is an entertainment center, the devil will also have a fun game with you all the time. He'll always enjoy your company. Come and play ping pong with you. <laughs> or basketball game with you. Or play, what do you call that? Uh, table soccer. Table. Ah, table soccer uh, or matchbox. Xbox. Xbox. <laughs> ah, all, all other kind of games. Entertainment games. Please. There, there is no time to play games anymore. We are at the end of the age where we are standing upon evil days. And the Apostle Paul told us, put on the whole armor of God because you are standing in evil days. It's warfare time, not games time. Finally, the key to enter the holy place as the Melchizedek order priest. What is the key? We, we, we said this, we said that, all the benefits. Now, okay, we should enter into the holy place. What is the key? Two keys. Faith and boldness. Two keys. Boldness because Jesus' blood, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have obtained mercy to enter before his throne fearlessly. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16, chapter 10 verse 19 to 22. Secondly, second key, faith. Faith means confidence, trust. You come before God's throne without feeling condemned, without feeling ashamed. You have that confidence, faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 to 23. And there is a bonus key. You buy two, get one free. <laughs> so the bonus is, hold fast to your confession. What does that mean? Hold fast to your confession means, don't doubt anything. Hebrews 10, 27. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 21 verses 21 to 22, Mark chapter 11 verse 24, when you pray, doubt not. That's the thing, you know, when you come before the throne of God, don't doubt whether your prayer will be heard or not heard. Don't doubt whether God will hear me or not. Get rid of that doubt. That doubt is one of the 31 kings that you must kill, slaughter, doubt. You know, you are going to stand there not because you are a good person or because you have learned through all this. No. You are standing there because of the blood of Jesus. <coughs> Number one. Number two, the very fact that God is going to pay attention to you, not because who, who you are, because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. 